All right, the record will show the presence of the defendant and all counsel. The jury is not present. Mr. Nurmi, you have a motion. Yes, Judge. Uh, at this time, we're going to renew our motion for uh, sequestration of the jury. Um, last night, uh, there was uh, a apparently, however they were obtained, at least at this point, we're not for sure, interview tapes uh, of Miss Arias' parents uh, in Wairica, California, were obtained by the media, as well as uh, journal entries from Miss Arias' entire uh, journal that was seized during a warrant. Uh, these were broadcast and read uh, ad nauseum uh, co in conjunction with this motion and in conjunction with the reports. One of the reports mentioned that the county attorney's office had provided these diaries to Miss Arias. So it, consistent with this motion and also the corollary of the misconduct motions that are still pending before this court and are cumulative in nature, we would be asking that the county attorney advise the court either deny having done that or concede having done that on the record at this time. Mr. Martinez? I don't see the relevance of whether or not the county attorney's office provided that or not. That's uh, an issue beyond my control, but my understanding was that there was a uh, public record request. I don't know who made the public record request for the um, two videos that Mr. Nermi's talking about. They actually don't watch the media as much as the defense counsel seems to, so I don't really know whether or not that was played or not. Additionally, there was a public record request, my understanding, for the journals, and that, that was something that was provided. Um, there are many public records requests that are pending for the Maricopa County Attorney's Office right now, and I don't know what they all involve, but I do know that there are many. Well, Judge, as this court knows and the case law tells us, uh, that this case must be tried in the courtroom, not in the media. That's one of the one of the, the boundaries. If we want to try this case outside the courtroom, and that's what the county attorney's office seems to be conceding now, I'm willing to do that as well. But as it relates to the jury, this is the kind of information we've just heard the county attorney's office concede that they are putting out there, that the jurors can hear. If we are to believe, you know, the court asks the question of the jurors every morning, have you seen, or not every morning, on a weekly basis, have you seen anything on the media in a group? Uh, no one raises their hand. No one wants to be singled out. But to believe that to be true is to believe an absolute fiction. It is a fairy tale to, to, uh, to assume that this jury is not hearing any of this. It is all over the news, be it local or national. So again, you know, if this release of information done by the county attorney's office, this does affect Ms. Arias' right to a fair trial. It is disseminating information that would not otherwise come before the jury and affects her right to a fair trial. If we, again, if we were to believe this fiction that the jury doesn't see any of this, okay. But again, it is a fiction that is beyond belief. I might add to this, coming in this morning, I saw the media photographer who I believe works for HLN, move forward towards the door as he saw the jury bus. Jurors number one, four, six, and 17, and I believe 13 were all coming in. I do not know if they were photographed or not. At this point, in time, I couldn't tell based on the way the position of the gentleman was holding the camera, but we have to concede these facts as well. These are facts that the jury is not excluding. There is no doubt about it. We don't even need to rely on a fiction to know that the jurors were photographed this morning because, or cameras were outside there this morning because I, I witnessed it myself. So judge, given all this, I'm asking the court to no longer rely on this fiction that this jury is not seeing any of this media and sequester the jury immediately. Mr. Martinez. Um, I'm not sure where defense counsel gets the legal authority or the clairvoyance to know what the jurors are um, thinking or what they're seeing. Uh, again, it appears that defense counsel is much more preoccupied with the news and what is being broadcast than actually listening to what the jurors are saying. Um, it is problematic to say that the jurors are lying, which is what he's saying, when he has nothing to back it up. The jurors have 
been on numerous occasions, I don't know how many, been asked whether or not they are subjected to any media coverage and they have all answered uniformly that they have not. There is no reason to believe that the jurors are watching anything uh, if they say that they are not. So I would ask that the court deny defendant's request to sequester the jury. It's a motion for reconsideration under Rule 16. I don't see that anything has changed. The jurors have indicated that they will abide by the court's uh, instruction, and that's what we have to rely on. Um, we can, of course, um, fictionalize what we believe that they are seeing or not seeing. <coughs> they have indicated that they are not seeing anything. We can question them again when they come into open court, and uh, I believe that that takes care of the matter. Right. The court has repeatedly admonished the jury to avoid media coverage during the trial. I have inquired on a regular basis to determine if any juror has seen or heard anything about this case in the media. I have inquired in the courtroom and I have inquired of the jurors one-on-one -on -one in chambers with the parties present. There is no indication whatsoever that any juror has failed to follow the court's admonition or has seen even inadvertently any media coverage of this case. Based upon the law in this state, I am denying the request to sequester the jury at this time. As authority for this court's decision, I am citing State versus Shad, S-C-H-A-D, 129 Arizona 557. State versus Atwood, 171, Arizona 632. State versus Bible, 175, Arizona 574. And State versus Tyson, 129, Arizona 551. All right. With regard to the motion for mistrial that we heard testimony on last week, I understand that uh, the additional witness is available today. Mr. Nermi, did you want to call that witness at some point today? Your Honor, has the court reviewed exhibit number two? I have not, but I will over the noon hour. I thought you wanted to present it during the... During I would like the court to review it and then have the uh, Ms. Wong, the witness, the opportunity to uh, review it as well. Um, okay. Right now, uh, as a concern given that Miss Violet was ill and her schedule, um, I'm interested in moving forward with that. Certainly, um, if time can be made uh, elsewhere, uh, we can uh, pick that motion up. All right. Ms. LaViolette, please come forward and take the stand. Bring in the jury. Please stand for the jury. Please be seated. The record will show the presence of the jury, the defendant, and all counsel. Excuse me, I forgot my glasses. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, while the witness is retrieving her eyeglasses, have any of you seen or heard anything about this case in the media since I last inquired? I see no hands. Has anyone attempted to speak with any of you about this case? I see no hands. Ms. Wilmot, you may continue. Good morning, Ms. Violet. Good morning, Ms. Wilmot. Uh, we I'd like to talk to you about some text messages from March 22nd of 2008, okay? Sure. Uh, I'm handing you uh, the mark of Exhibit 440, turn to page 63. And, and we're talking about the nature of their relationship and how uh, we've talked about how it's gone uh, from violent back to the loving respite, things like that. So when we look at the text messages from March 22nd of 2008, uh, do you see a text message there where Mr. Alexander, in his own words, is inviting Miss Arias over? Yes, I do. Okay, and, and in his own words, is he telling her to make, himself, make herself at home? Yes, he is. And uh, 
What does that say to you about the nature of their relationship at this point in March of 2008? Looks like a comfortable relationship where there's a lot of back and forth and, and they're able to, uh, that they're both uh, inviting one another to things and, and it's pretty, you know, during these periods, things are pretty okay. All right. Uh, and when somebody tells somebody, in your own experience, when somebody says, make yourself at home, does that mean that they're welcome to be there? Yes, it does. Okay. Are you aware of any other communications between Mr. Alexander and other women where he complained of having a stalker? Yes. And do you know specifically the women that he said that to? He um, said it specifically, I know, to a woman by the name of Reagan. He said it specifically to a woman by the name of Lisa. And at this point in their relationship, by March of 2008, have you seen any indications of any type of stalking from Jody to, Tra to Mr. Okay. Alexander. Lack of foundation, and if we may approach, please. Yes. Yes. All right, Ms. Violet, and everything that you've reviewed, the text messages, the emails, the journal entries, and you've reviewed Mr. Uh, Alexander's journal entries as well, right? Yes, I have. And in reviewing all this information, did you ever see any type of indications of stalking activity from Ms. Arias to Mr. Alexander? No, I didn't. At, uh, at this point in, in their relationship, does it appear that there's any type of uh, stalking going on? No, it doesn't. And do you base that on Mr. Alexander's own words when he talks about inviting her over? Objection leading by recommendation. Distinct. What do you base that on? On the, on the nature of the relationship, on his willingness to have her over, um, on his, you know, connection with her, as well as her connection with him. All right. Do we have... In, in late March of 2008, there are a number of text messages between Mr. Alexander and, and Ms. Arias. Is that right? Yes. And do you see a continuation in those text messages? And let me know if you need to review them. But do you see a continuation of this relationship of a, a general, natural type relationship between the two of them? Yes. Yes. Okay. Is, there, is there a point in time when uh, Mr. Alexander uh, tells Miss Arias to empty her voicemail because he's been trying to get a hold of her for a week? Yes, there is. Does he ever... He based, on, based on the text message, it, it, is this in a text message to her? I get the text messages and the IMs. I, you know, mixed up. It's 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 down on paper. Okay, all right. And uh, when he does this, is is in your opinion, is he nice about it, or is it more of an order from him? He basically tells her to empty it out. So based on what you've read of his own words, does it seem to be more of an order, or is he asking nicely? Because out of concern. It seems like he's... Approach, please. All right, Ms. Pilot. So based on Mr. Alexander's words in that, in that written communication, did you consider, based on your experience in dealing with uh, men who have controlling issues or jealousy issues, do you, how, did you take, uh, how did you take that message from him to Ms. Arias about her voicemail? that um, he was upset that her voicemail was full. He hadn't been able to get in touch with her for a week through voicemail, and then he told her to empty it out. Distinct. All right, so you, you got, your impression was that he was upset about her voicemail being full? Yes. All right, and did, and did you get the impression that he told her to empty it? Objection. Yes. Leading, hearsay. Trying to prevent questions. Sustained. 
All right. What was the impression then about how he told her to do it? What was your impression about how he told her to do it? Ordering her to do it. All right. At the end of March in 2008, did you also review uh, a written communication between Mr. Alexander and a woman named Chriselle? Yes. And during this communication, is this, um, well, Chriselle was another woman that he was communicating with, is that right? Yes, she okay. was. And in this communication, what was the overall subject matter of this communication? It was uh, graphically sexual. Um, but also, um, um, the impression was that she was a vulnerable woman, that she was married, she was... Based on what she writes in her emails back to him, did you get an impression that she was uh, about her? Yes, I did. Uh, okay. And what was your impression of her? That she was emotionally... Objection, lack of foundation, hearsay. Sustained. Judge, may we approach? Yes. Sustained. All right, Ms. Leviolette, in this particular email with this woman named Chriselle, you said that it was of a very graphic sexual nature? Yes, it was. Okay. And this was at the end of, of March of 2008? Yes, it was. Just may I approach the witness? Yes. I'm handing you, Ms. LaViolette, what's been marked in Exhibit 594. Do you recognize this as uh, a journal entry from Mr. Alexander's journal? Yes. Okay, so this is something that... Based on it coming from his journal, you would understand it was something he wrote. Yes. All right, and we're looking at uh, March 27th of 2008. Yes. In this particular journal entry is Mr. Alexander talking about the move that uh, Jody is making back to California. Yes, he is. And is he talking... What is the subject matter of this? He's talking about the move. Objection, hearsay. Well, the world. The move is something that will be good for both of them, that discipline is hard and that he will miss her, but that the move will be good for both of them in terms of um, him wanting to get married and, and move on, and both of them in terms of a sexual sense, I, I believe. But... Uh, he talks about their lack of discipline a little bit. Okay. Uh, does he talk about it, himself needing more discipline? Yes. Okay. All right. And March 30th, so, so just a few days away from this journal entry. And, and just so we are clear on where we're at in the relationship, by late March, Mr. Alexander obviously knows because uh, Jody has told him that she is moving home. Back to California. Yes. And on March 30th of 2008, uh, was there a, an argument over text messages? I, I mean, not, not about text messages. Did they have an argument that you can read about through text messages between Mr. Alexander and Ms. Arias? Yes. All right, and was that... What was the what was the uh, subject matter of the argument? There was um, a, a text message late in the evening from Mr. Alexander to Miss Arias, and um, she was half asleep, didn't respond really well. I, I, may we approach? Okay. See. All right, we were talking about the text messages on March, or yes, March 30th of 2008. Yes. Was there an, 
from reading your review of the, these text messages, was there an argument going on between Mr. Alexander and Jody? Yes, there was. All right. And in this argument, in this argument, is Mr. Alexander upset because Miss Arias hung up on him? Y yes, he is. Overruled. Yes, he is. And does she explain that she's upset with him that she hung up because he was swearing at her? I'm sorry, I didn't hear your question. You're going to repeat it. The, the question is, is does, does, um, does she explain that he, why she hung up because he was swearing at her? Overruled. You may answer. Yes. And this is... And this, these text messages, uh, when they're arguing with each other over these text messages, <clears throat> lasts about 35, 40 minutes? Yes. Okay. The fact that Miss Arias was able to hang up on Mr. Alexander for, after swearing at her, does that speak to her ability to start to have some boundaries? Yes. Okay. Yes. And is that, um, is that further evidence of her, of her pulling away from him? Yes. When she, when she establishes boundaries, it's because she's being able to distance. Okay, and just because we're talking about her establishing a ba ha being able to establish a boundary or being able to, on this particular occasion, not tolerate his swearing, does that mean she's completely out of the relationship? No, not at all. All right, and this is something that you see in your practice and your expertise with battered women that they can um, have a moment where they're able to stand up to the abuser and then they go right back to them? Yes, they do. On April 1st, right after this argument that they have, on March 30th, does Mr. Alexander, in his own words, well, does he text, does he send a text to Ms. Arias about how much he's going to miss her? And the timing on that text, if you need to find it, is April 1st at 5.45. Yes. Yes, he does. And in that text message is, uh, from your impression from that text message, based on what he says in there, is he apologetic? He's apologetic and says so she's a fantastic yes, person. Yes. I'm, I'm sorry, what did you say? He's apologetic, and he says she's a fantastic person. All right, as we move into April of 2008, this is the, this is the month that Miss Arias leaves. Is that right? Is that right? Yes. Okay. And uh, was there something else that was important to you about the April 1st text? I think what was really important about the April 1st text was him saying that, or, or the impression yes. is that if he had treated her half as well as she deserved, they would have never had an argument. Okay. So, and, and when I asked you about apologetic, is that, is that where you're getting that from? I'm getting the apology from that, yes. All right. Uh, and it, it, do you see uh, abusive men in your groups? Do you see them doing this type of thing where they start to blame themselves or they're taking on blame for how the relationship is? It depends on the person, but uh, many of them certainly feel remorse. They certainly are sorry. It's more the ability to go forward with that. It's more the ability to continue to act on being sorry. And for many of the folks that I've worked with, it's sort of the world as it affects me kind of remorse. It's I feel bad, you might leave, or uh, you might have a bad impression of me, so I'm going to do what it takes to sort of win you back. But over time, there's a development of genuine remorse. 
you have to be able to look at yourself before you can do that. Okay. Is that something that in order to get the men in your group, is that something that you're attempting to get them to that point where they're able to look at it in an honest uh, way? Yes, and you, you have to feel good enough about yourself to look at yourself honestly. So they have to be in the program long enough. And it depends on where they start because everybody starts at a different place. So it depends on how far somebody has to go before they're able to look at themselves. I mean, some people begin to look at themselves relatively rapidly, and other people it takes them a lot longer. Okay. All right, I want to talk about in April, uh, there's a fourth uh, violent incident. Is that right? Yes, there is. Okay. And in, in that particular incident, did you speak to Jody about it? Yes, I did. And what is it that you learned that happened that's important to you? There was an argument about uh, her being interested in two other men. And when she talked about that, which was elicited from a conversation that they had, not just volunteered, but elicited, um, when that happened, uh, Mr. Alexander got very angry and he threw her down, straddled her, and choked her. Uh, are you aware of how, how severe the choking was? She lost consciousness, and she woke up coughing a little while later. All right. What does choking mean to you? I know yesterday we talked about the conflict tactic scale. Did, wh wh where, where is choking? Choking's um, on the severe end, and for many of the women I work with, they don't get choked. Choking is very personal, it's very close up, um, and it's, you know, life-threatening. So it's, it's a very serious form of abuse from my perspective. Does it speak, do you see any type of an escalation when we talk about the physical violence that's happening in 2008 and the emotional uh, abuse that's happening in 2008? Do you see escalation? I see escalation. Uh, we're talking about uh, just about a month's difference. Uh, we went from October to January, January to March. Now it's March to April. And the verbal abuse is starting to escalate as well. At the same time? Right. Based on the text messages and the other print messages that I've read. Okay. When speaking to Jody about what happened on this particular day, did she talk to you about whether or not she tried to um, defend herself against him? She said she started to defend herself, but she was afraid she would hurt him, and she stopped. Is that, is that inconsistent with women that you've talked to before about battered women that you've, other battered women that you speak to, spoke to before? No, it's uh, not inconsistent when I've taken self-defense classes and women don't even want to hit somebody. It's the, the experience of physical contact for or, or contact sports and, and, you know, fighting in the playground or whatever. Most women don't have that kind of experience. Um, there are women that do, definitely, but, but most women don't have that kind of experience. And so uh, they're uncomfortable with it and, and, for many, uncomfortable about hurting somebody else. So... At this point, so she says that she she did she ended up not wanting to hurt him, and that was her reasoning. Yes. All right. And did she also lose consciousness? Yes. What about minimizing? When you speak to Jody about some of these incidents, especially the physical incidents, any I guess to the emotional abuse, do you see any minimizing that's going on? I see a fair amount of minimizing that's going on. Uh, and, and before you go on with that. Uh, specifically with Jody, can you talk to us about what minimizing is? Minimizing is just taking an incident and making it less important or less significant than it than it w might be to somebody else. That you know, an outsider might look at it and see it as as a bigger thing than the person who's describing it. And do battered have you in your experience? Do battered women minimize the abuse that they've taken? Many of battered women minimize the abuse that they were taken that and, has and in, happened. And your experience, why do they do that? Well, a number of reasons. One is that um, it's hard to take in something that is very painful to you. Um, it's easier to sort of 
make it less than it is. The other thing is that with the gradual nature, the gradual escalation of domestic violence, uh, what used to be a, uh, a misdemeanor or what used to be a crime is a misdemeanor. So that, so that for instance, um, maybe I said to myself, nobody will ever lay a hand on me, and then somebody lays a hand on me, and that's part of what happens. Or nobody will ever call me this kind of a name, and they call me this kind of a name, and that's happening. And I'm not ready to leave that relationship, and I'm tied in for all those other reasons. Then I learn that that's just the way somebody is, and maybe they're going to do that, but they're not going to go any further until they go further. So that's part of the gradual nature for most of these cases is is one of the other reasons that people minimize. Okay. Have you seen battered women minimize uh, the abuser's actions? in an effort to, apec- to protect the abuser's reputation. Absolutely. Okay. Or not talk about it at all. Or not talk about it at all. And we talked about that yesterday, about it's co- how common it is to not report, not call the doctor, not call the police, right? Yes. Specifically with Jody, and speaking with Jody, did you detect minimization from her? Yes, from the very first time that I interviewed her. Um, she really didn't talk about... Uh, the domestic violence uh, very much. She didn't want to see herself as somebody who was abused, and she talked about it as isolated instances uh, without looking at the the, uh, sort of rapid escalation. What about the verbal abuse? Does she, what does she, does she minimize that? She minimizes it throughout the uh, IMs and the text messages as sort of, she, she moves on after a very, you know, what I would consider a very aggressive and demeaning um, argument, she moves on to uh, regular kinds of conversation. And she calls it rude. Um, I would have other names for it. Okay. All right. Well, let's... Let, let's talk about some of those times, because now we're in April, and, and you were talking about how April you start to see an escalation. Is that right, in, in violence? Yes. Well, I, I don't start to see it. I started to see it before, and, and I'm seeing more. Okay, so you're seeing more as we get to April. Yes. Okay. All right, on April 7th, all right, I'm looking at April 7th. Let me do this. And actually, this is in evidence as Exhibit 444. So do we see on the beginning of April 7th when we're talking about where he's, he's asking her, where are you? You see that? Yes. And she answers in Hollister with a smiley face. Yes. And so do you see basically a normal conversation? Yes. And then we skip a few hours later and we see this long text message, right? Yes. And based on the fact that it's outgoing, that means it's coming from Mr. Alexander, right? Yes. Okay. I'm going to zoom it in so we can see it. And so just prior, just hours prior to this text message, we have A normal conversation, right? Yes, we do. All right, and then he starts this with, do not call me and do not text me anything, right? Yes. And it appears that he wants information from her. Is that right? Yes. Did you speak to Miss Arias about what this tirade is about? Yes. And So do you have a background understanding of what Mr. Alexander wanted from her? Yes. What is that? He wanted the identity of a woman who had come to her restaurant and reported to her that Mr. Alexander had a, uh, a significant relationship with Lisa Andrews and wanted her to know about that. And was this significant relationship with Lisa Andrews during the time that he was also with Jody? Yes. Okay. And so in this particular text message, he's talking about um, her getting that information to him right away. Yes. And he's demanding that it, it takes 15 minutes and it and she won't take the 15 minutes to do that. Is that right? Yes. And he's, tell, he's accusing her of lying about it, isn't he? Yes. Um, 
and he starts to talk about that she better tell the truth or give me your imaginary friend with the worst BS story you have ever told or leave me alone, Yeah. right? But yet instead of leaving her alone, he continues in his tirade, doesn't he? Yes, he does. He talks to her about how it's a lie like no other. It's freaking foolish, right? Yes. And there's no way out. You've screwed up your story so bad you can't mend it. Yes. And this is all he's talking about is the fact that a woman told her he was in another relationship at the same time he was in a relationship with Jody, right? Yes. And he's ups from this from this text message, can you tell whether or not he seems upset about that? He seems very upset about it, very angry about it. All right. Now the anger then turns into threats, doesn't it? Yes, it does. He talks about you have till tomorrow to give me this person's information. And then he threatens her, right? Yes, he does. He threatens to tell the Hugheses, which we know at that point are his good friends, and in January of 2007, they loved Jody, right? Yes. To tell the Hugheses, to tell her friend Leslie Udy, and anyone else that matters about all the crazy things that you've done, right? Yes. And then he tells, he tells her to either fess up, right? Yes, to fess does. up or feel his wrath. Yes. And he tells her that no matter how bad the truth is, the pro he promises that the punishment will be worse than the lie. Is that right? Punishment will be better. Oh, I'm sorry. Punishment yeah. will be better than the lie. Yes. And again, he talks to her about truth. Nothing else from you until the truth, right? Yes. And then he ends that with, after tomorrow, it's going to get real bad for you. Time to spit it out. Yes. In this particular text message, he keeps accusing her of lying, doesn't he? Yes, he does. And he's accusing her of lying about information that is bad about him, right? Yes, it is. But in, based on all your reading and review of the materials, was this true, that he was in a relationship with Lisa Rant Andrews at the same time he was in a relationship with Jody? Yes, he Is it true? Approach. You may continue. Ms. LaViolette, have you read through Ms. Andrews' interviews and emails and written communications? Yes. Are you aware of when she had a relationship with Mr. Alexander? From July of 07 through March of 08. And during that time, are you aware of whether or not Mr. Alexander was also in a relationship with Jody Arias? Yes, he was. Okay. So when, when Mr. Alexander is accusing Ms. Arias of lying about in bad information about him, right. that's what we're talking about in the text, right? Yes. That bad information is is actually something that happened, isn't it? Being in a relationship with two different women. Judge's speculation, like foundation. She laid the foundation. Of world. Yes, in fact, Miss Andrews, he has a similar conversation with Miss Andrews in one of their communications where he's suggesting to Miss Andrews that if she listens to other people, she's going to get false information about him. Okay. So based on his communications with Ms. Andrews, basically telling her not to believe things that she hears about him, right? Right. And now he's upset with Ms. Arias for saying, I heard something bad about you. Yes. In this particular text message, is, is, there, uh, is it important to you the way how long this text message is or, or how he words things to... Jody in this text message? Well, there, there are veiled threats in it. And I, I mean, the threats, uh, you know, are, are sort of nondescript, uh, some of them. But some of them are talking at, about telling people that she cares about. Um, I, don't know, I don't know what crazy things he's talking about. I don't know if he's talking about the sexual things. I can't imagine that would be there, because uh, that would include him. So I'm not certain what he's talking about. I, is, it, is the important part to you the fact that he's threatening to talk badly about her to her closest friends? 
it's that's one of the things and then he talks about feeling the wrath and I'm not sure you know your mind goes where your your mind goes so when someone would say that um, and, and I've had people who I work with who make these nine nondescript kind of threats but they're threats and they sort of uh, undermine somebody's basic security if if somebody you care about and somebody you love makes threats towards you, even if they are not specific, they still can be very undermining. What about somebody who makes a threat of feel my wrath when he's already kicked her and broken her finger? Well, that has, um, once again... The, uh, the statement in the text message, it's not feel my wrath, it's feel the wrath. Thank you. So when somebody says feel the wrath, well, and let me just little check. When somebody says feel the wrath, whether it's his wrath or the wrath, uh, does that make any difference to the person themselves, do you think? When somebody has been choked, when someone has been kicked, when they have broken, had their finger broken, when they have been slapped across the neck or the, uh, the face, by one person, and that person tells them, feel the wrath. What does that do? Is that abusive? I think it's abusive. I think most battered women would think. No is this something that battered women in general have to deal with? It depends on the, the level of abuse in the relationship, but if someone makes a threat, and you care about that someone, and there's been a history of abusive behavior prior to that, it's going to have significant meaning to you. So in other words, when somebody who, who you love is saying these horrible things to you, do, is that more significant than someone you don't know? Is that what you mean? No, I'm saying because it has happened, oh. and because you've seen it happen, then it has meaning. So in other words, it's just not a veiled threat. It's a veiled threat that's attached to reality. <laughs> okay, okay. All right, so at this point in time, do you continue to characterize this relationship as abusive? Yes. I'm showing you what's been in evidence as Exhibit 445. This is text messages between Mr. Alexander and Ms. Arias uh, on April 8th. So this is just the next day. And we start up top where he, he's talking about uh, her leaving something behind when she moved. Are you, did you speak to Ms. Arias about the context of these text messages? Yes, I, um, yes Mr. Alexander had uh, gotten a picture for her and um, she wanted him to sign it and he signed it and then she forgot and left it when she was packing she she forgot to include that and he was upset about it all right and that's is that how this argument seems to start with him being upset that she left it yes behind yes and he's talking about he says thanks a freaking lot for having me sign that drawing ink and then deciding you were going to leave it. If it's not one thing, it's another with you. Always drama, right? Yes. And her response is, hmm, it doesn't sound like it's me that's being dramatic, dear. Call ASAP. Right? Yes. So her response to his, uh, his text message is somewhat innocuous, right? Sustained. How do you take her response? I take it as, as um, her sort of coming back at him and saying, it's not me that's being dramatic, it's you. Okay. And he responds immediately with, well, he responds about 11 minutes later saying, do not call back. I'm sick of you playing stupid and dealing with childish tactics, right? Yes. And then he goes on for another text talking about, it was a stupid ass way of ruining yet another of mine. And does he talk about her ruining his days? Yes, he does. And he says, bitter feelings are brewing in me towards you, right? Yes. 
And he, he says he's going to have a genuine dislike for her if she keeps this behavior up. Is that the general idea? Yes. And the behavior that he's talking about is that she forgot a picture at his house when she moved. Yes. And he's asking her to stop it before he starts seeking revenge. Yes. When he starts talking about revenge, is that something that can be seen as a threat to someone who's already been kicked and choked and had, broken, and had a broken finger? Yes. How do you take her response? She starts it with sorry. How do you, how do you take her response? What do you make of it? Well, it's, it's a pattern that she seems to have, which is when he gets really upset, um, she apologizes for her behavior. And is that what she's doing in this conversation? Sounds like it to me. And she tells him, if you burn it, I'll understand. Just try to have a good day. Don't worry, don't worry be happy. Yes. So is there anything in here that she responds in a, in, a, in a mean or a violent way back to him? No. And in response to her telling him to have a good day, he responds with another long text. Is that right? Yes. He tells her that it was rude and inconsiderate for her to forget the picture, right? Yes, he, he goes on and on. Okay. And does he talk about how he's trying to save his house? Yes. And that he doesn't believe that she's sorry? Yes, he doesn't believe she's sorry. And that if she was sorry, that uh, you wouldn't continue onward with this stuff. Yes. And, and again, this fight is about the fact that she left a picture, right? At his yes. house. Yes. And does he tell her that if he had done the same thing to her, she would cry for weeks? Yes, he does. Is that something that you've seen uh, common, uh, that people comment about Jody? crying, being a crier? Yes. What, what have you seen? I've seen uh, Mr. Alexander uh, describe her as crying. In written communication? Oh. Overall. Oh, okay. In written communications, um, he has described her as a crier, uh, and I believe it was Mr. McCartney. I'm not sure if it was Mr. McCartney. I think it was Mr. McCartney who also described her as a crier. A previous boyfriend of hers? Yes. Okay. That basically when she gets upset, she cries? Yes. And is that what Mr. Alexander is saying here? That she that you cry for weeks? Yes. And he talks about how he'll give her motivation to quit to quit screwing with me, right? Yes. And again, is that something who has that can be considered threatening for someone who's already been choked and kicked and had a broken finger and yes. slapped and hit? Yes. After that long text to her, we see her response. And again, how do you take, what do you make of her response? That, well, a couple things. I think one thing is that, that she's apologizing again, um, and I think trying to de-escalate the situation. But um, she's also talking about distance is making sort of... Um, clears her head a little bit. Because at this point in time, she's, she's now away from him, right, in California? Yes. yes, she is. All right. And is this something, This you said de-escalation? Yes. What does that mean that she's doing? It means that she's trying to calm the situation down, that when he gets upset and gets angry, that there are two things that seem to be consistent. One is, is um, you know, apologizing and being sorry, and the other is being sexual. All right, so here we see her responses that she talks about how good she feels that they're separated. Is that right? 
Well, she feels good, but she feels she thinks it's going to be better for both of them. Okay. And does she tell him that she loves him? Yes, she does. And does she say nice things to him, that she's happy and thankful? Yes. And then does she blame herself for leaving the picture to just chalk it up to one last ditzy thing? Yes. And then we see uh, a couple hours later, she writes him to thank him for calling to say that. That was very nice of you. You see that? Yes. And then based on the rest of the text messages, does it seem that that tirade is over? Yes, it does. Did you review uh, Mr. Alexander's journal entry? And I'm looking at April 8th, which I think you already have it up there. Yes, I do. It was all stapled together. Yeah. So on April 8th, is he talking about Jody? He's talking about um, Jody and Deanna. Okay. And what's the, what, what is the subject matter of his own words in his journal? That he really wants to find someone that he can marry, and it will be a lot easier for him to do that now that Jody's moved and Deanna is going to move. Okay. Uh, and does he talk about being stressed for money? Yes, he does. He talks about... Um, And how does he feel about Lisa, Lisa Andrews? Well, he misses Lisa Andrews. But he's really talking about Mimi. Hearsay. Oh. Besides missing Lisa Andrews, what is he really talking about? Hearsay. Summary, Judge. Restate your question. Besides missing Lisa Andrews, we know you're not quoting, right? Yes. Okay, so the, what, is, what else is he talking about? What, what subject matter do you get out of this? Well, that he misses, uh, he misses Lisa and that he sort of feels like a fool for going after Mimi. Okay, so in this particular journal entry, he's talking about, I guess, some of the women problems that he's having? Yes, and that he feels like an idiot. Okay. Degree. And this was from April 8th? Yes. So just close in time to when he just had this um, tirade with Jody through text? Yes. All right, on April 19th of 2008, I'm talking about text messages. April 19th? April 19th. Uh-huh. And I just want to talk to you about the gist of what you get out of these particular messages from Mr. Alexander to Miss Arius. He, there's, there's a number of texts here, and um, basically... Mr. Alexander is offended because he feels that Miss Arius has insulted him um, about his speaking ability, and um, she's denying that. Um, he he goes through and uh, uh, talks about. I asked for the gist. He's he's talking about her painting. Um, she says that he's. She's reminded the summary that she shouldn't be reading the exhibit. Sustained. I'm do you sorry. Need to, do, you, do I need to review it? If you need to review it. Sure. Okay. All right. Do you see in these in the, these this exchange between the two of them? Do you see any evidence of him or indication of Mr. Alexander guilting her, guilting Miss Arias? Yes. About not helping him or not spending time with him. Yes. And. In general, what is her response to that? That she... Whatever the exhibit number is in front of her. Sustained. This is a very long text message. Okay. Just so well, you know. In, in general, when she responds to him, 
Is she doing what she has done in the past, where she's trying to take it down a notch? Yes, she is. At this point in time, she's in California, right? Yes, she is. So why would a woman in this particular situation even respond when you're getting nasty text messages from somebody who's not even in the same state with you? Why, why is it that people respond to something like that? Well, they started their relationship, the first eight months of it being in separate states. Um, but she's still attached to him. She still has feelings about him, uh, about the good parts of him that she really appreciates and cares about. And although she's got physical distance, she really doesn't have emotional distance. I mean, she has some emotional distance, but not enough to break it off. Okay. And is this how we talk about how she's taking steps to distance herself, but she's not completely separated? Exactly. Is this something that you see in with other battered women that they do, where they're, they may take steps to get away, but yet they, they're, they're not completely separating themselves? Yes, and it's, um, it's not uncommon at all for people to, to make multiple uh, breaks and go back. In fact, Lisa Andrews talks about that. She talks about um, their, their relationship. I'm sorry, your objection? You're safe. Sustained. What about what Ms. Andrews had talked about with Mr. Alexander? Do you know this from reading uh, emails of hers? Yes. And in, is the information that she talks about the way that she and Mr. Ale Alexander's relationship go back and forth, is that something that's important to you? Yes. In your ultimate consideration with the way that Mr. Alexander and Ms. Arias went back and forth? Yes. Based on the your reading of her emails, what is the summary, what's the subject matter that you get from there that's important to your ultimate opinion? That every time they break up, and they break up through this relationship. Approach. So what is it that, about the relationship between Lisa Andrews and Miss Alexander that is important to you, that you were just about to say? Mr. Alexander's ability to win women back and, and that Ms. Andrews talks about every time that they break up, he addresses her concerns and she feels connected to him again and she says he can, uh, you know, he can always win her back, basically is the essence of it. Okay. And is that something that you see uh, as a pattern with the relationship with Ms. Arias and Mr. Alexander? Yes, I do. So is it surprising to you then that Miss Arias would respond to his text messages uh, or emails when she's in another state? No, it's not surprising to me. All right, and after the April 19th, 2008 uh, text message that we were just talking about, on April 20th, the very next day, does Mr. Alexander send Miss Arias a very nice text message? about talking about what he thinks of her? Yes, he actually does. He, he's talking about the world. Go ahead. He's, um, he's talking about going to a club. Are you giving us a summary of it? Yes. OK. May she continue, Judge? Yes. He's, he goes to a club, and um, he emails or texts um, Jody back and, and says that uh, he he really feels like she's one of the most beautiful women. Sustained. Are you giving us a summary of what the text message is? Yes. Okay. May she continue, Judge? Why don't you restate the question? All right. On April 20th, do you, based on your reading of the text messages, do you know that Mr. Alexander is not with Miss Arias? Yes, I do. And do you know that he is in a club with presumably other women? Yes. And you know this based on what he's saying in his text message? Yes. And does he send a text message to uh, Miss Arias? Yes, he does. And in that text message, does he compare her with the other women he has seen? Yes, he does. Hearsay. Overruled. Does he compare her to other women? Yes, he does. And does he compare her favorably? Yes, he does. In fact, does he compare her in a way that he talks about her inside beauty as well as her outside beauty? Yes, he does. 
Is it a very flattering text? It's a very flattering text. And this is the just very next day after they argued, after they argued, right? Yes, it is. Okay, let's talk about, we're talking, we've been talking about what you've, what you, how you start to see the escalation in violence, both physical and emotional, right? Yes. And so now we're moving into some of the fights that they have um, in May, okay? okay? Mm -hmm. So, and, and when I'm talking about these fights, I mean, these are what we've discussed so far, have you seen any any fighting from Miss Arias in, in her response text messages? No, I haven't. And are these text messages, these rants that are coming, who are they coming from? They're coming from Mr. Alexander. Would you characterize what he has, uh, would you characterize these long text messages that we just went through, would, how would you characterize them? As tirades or rants. Okay, and so who are these tirades or rants coming from? They're coming from Mr. Alexander. And being sent to whom? To Miss Arias. Okay, so let's talk about uh, May 10th, and this is in, in evidence as Exhibit 448. All right, and actually just, are you aware that these times are not, are actually seven hours ahead? Yes, I don't get it, but I, I understand that okay. I've been told that. All right. So if this is military time at 2.41 in the morning, seven hours earlier would actually be May 9th. Do you agree? Uh, yes. Okay. All right. So this one is incoming, meaning it's coming from Miss Arias. Is that right? Yes. Did you talk to Miss Arias about this group of text messages? Yes, I did. Uh, do you understand, do you have an understanding then as to this first message, whether it was intended for Mr. Alexander or not? It actually was supposed to be sent to someone else, and um, it was accidentally sent to Mr. Alexander. Okay. And after it was sent to Mr. Alexander, how is it that he responds? Is he upset? He seems to be very upset. All right. And we see him... In the next text message, we see him accusing her of being a liar, right? Yes. And based on your understanding of and read, reading through these text messages, is he upset with her because she's having communications with another man? Yes. And she, and was she trying, was she telling him, telling him about this, these communications with another man? No. In fact, she was trying to keep it more to herself because he didn't want to know details of her life. So um, she's not completely, she says she's not completely honest with him because he doesn't want to know details. Okay, and that's, you're talking about a text message down here when she's, she, Ms. Arias says that she was trying to move her business to a more private venue and that he, uh, he brought it up and that she's a single girl and she's not, she's a single girl talking to some guy and that there's nothing wrong with that. Is that the context? Yes. And she talks about not being completely honest about him, uh, not being completely honest about this other person with Mr. Alexander is a mistake, isn't it? That's what she said. That, that, I'm not, I'm not sure what you mean. Well, in other words, it, is she saying that by talking to Mr. Alexander about any interest she has in other men, is that a mistake for her to do? She feels that he does not want to know the details. Um, and does he get upset when, she, when he learns any details of her ever speaking with someone else? Yes. And at this point in time, they're not supposed to be in a relationship anymore, right? True. Uh, and how would you characterize his, Mr. <coughs> Alexander's behavior if he gets upset with Miss Arias for speaking with another man? Well, it's jealous behavior. Okay. And jealous behavior can be very controlling. And is that what you see in evidence of in these types of text messages? 
Yes, the further away she gets and the more she pulls away, I think the, the more jealous and insecure he probably gets. And, and that she, when he, when he reacts in that way, what I've seen is when someone who has had the power starts to lose it, it's a scary proposition for them. And they begin to react. If they're controlling, they begin to react in more controlling ways. Okay. I so see you're talking about, uh, like a man, uh, you're talking about Mr. Alexander. Yes. And initially we talked, when they, when they first met, we talked about the power differential and how Miss Arias looked up to him, right? Yes. And, that, and did you see a power differential with, yes. in their relationship? Yes. Who had the power for most of their relationship? It appeared, well, Mr. Alexander did. Okay. And as she, as she is moving away from him and, and making this move away from him, uh, you were talking about losing power. Does that, does that mean he loses power over her? Yes. He, well, in, in losing, in her distancing, he doesn't have control. Okay. And when he doesn't have control, or when someone who tends to be jealous and more controlling loses control, it's, it's a scary thing for them to lose control. That's been my experience with the men I've worked with who are jealous. Not everybody's jealous that I work with. Oh, right. So when you say scary, is that talking about the emotion of fear? Yes. And what does fear... Is there anything dangerous about somebody being fearful? Depends on how fearful they are, but fear is... Um, anger and rage are secondary emotions. So t to explain that, what do you mean? Um, anger is generally an emotion that covers up other emotions. If you had a, an iceberg and you had like anger at the top, underneath the iceberg, so you, anger would be at the tip, underneath the iceberg might be fear, rejection, powerlessness, that kind of thing, that escalates fear when someone tends to be abusive. Okay, so when we see Jody pulling away from Mr. Alexander and the, these, these tirades that he is doing through text messaging, is this evidence of his fear of, of, of losing her? It looks like that to me. And then in this, particu in this particular tirade about being upset about her speaking with somebody else, again, her response, when we look at her response, is she, uh, how is her response in, in, what do you make of her response? She's apologetic in her response that, um, but also explaining that he doesn't want to know the details and that maybe it was a mistake not to give him the details, but when she gives him details, he stops her, so she doesn't want to continue giving him details. Uh, but she says that nothing she said was untrue. So when she gives him details, he stops her, but when she doesn't give him details, he accuses her of lying. Yes. Is that what is going on here? Yes. And then he launches into this text message where he's talking about this this particular person some man that she was just having a conversation with or a text uh, texting with right yes what do you make of this particular text from mr alexander well he's he's angry he's he's jealous he's taking it to an extreme that um there's no indication that that's going on, but that's where he's going with it. Um, he seems to blow up, you know, the, the saying, making a mountain out of a molehill. It seems like that, that's going on here. And uh, then he starts criticizing her, which is what is pretty consistent in these messages. His criticism? Yes. And, does she, and what, how do you take her response at the top here? Well, it's, um, it's, there's some assertiveness there. There's some assertiveness about 
her saying, you know, don't ask me more questions, but also um, reassurance that she loves him, reassurance that she still still cares about him, and and advising that they they develop a don't ask, don't tell kind of policy that they don't ask each other about their the intimate details or the or about their social lives, about the people they're dating, that they that they stop doing that. And his response to that is to forget each other even exist, right? Yes. And again, is he taking that to extremes? Seems like it, yes. Okay, so down here, she had asked him to please stop, right? To please stop... Um, Stop the ranting, right? Yes, yes. And he responds to that, doesn't he? Yeah, he responds with more threats. Okay, and he tells her that she's going to start to be held accountable for your shiz. Yeah. Shiz is another word for a bad word, right? Yes. And he talks about how he's pissed, how she's pissed him off in ways that she never should have. Yes. And and he tells her too that he's given her a lot of mercy, right? Yes. So basically the way he considers, based on that statement, the way he considers he's treated her so far, he's been merciful. One of the things we say, um, people who do a lot of work with perpetrators of domestic violence, is that they have perceptual problems. They seem to have a way of seeing things that a lot of other people wouldn't, they wouldn't view them that way. Okay. And he talks about how times are fixing to get tough for her. Yeah. Is that another threat? Yes. And are you aware that in this text message, he, he wants the second half of, a, of the message, um, the message that was not intended for him was one of two parts, and he wants the second part, right? Yes. And so throughout this text message uh, tirade, he's, he's waiting for her to send the second part. Yes. Is that controlling? Behavior, wanting to have that second part to know what it said? Yes, it's controlling behavior. And what does it say, the fact that, that Jody is trying to get him the second part of the text message? She's going to give it to him anyway when she's not even living in the same state. It says the same thing that the whole pattern has said, that she's not out of the relationship yet. And again, down here at the bottom, is she saying sorry? Yes, she is. And that she never meant, means to hurt him? Yes. And she talks about how she loves him? Yes. <laughs> and eventually, does Mr. Alexander apologize too? Yes, he does. And if we look at the times, knowing that these aren't the accurate times, but I'm talking about the difference in times, we see that, that this whole thing started at 2.41, right? Yes. And it didn't end until 5.54. Yes. So three and a half hours about, well, three hours and 13 minutes about, right? Yes. Does that mean anything to you that, that this fighting or ranting from Mr. Alexander can last for three hours? At this point, um, it looks like um, he, he does most of the ranting. And to be able to keep your anger going for that long, um, that takes a lot of energy. Not everybody keeps their anger going that long. Lots of people will calm down prior to that. Uh, but he's able to keep it going. He's able to regenerate the energy and that anger uh, by the things that he says. And when you talk aggressively, uh, it's one of the things that a lot of the fellows in my group are working on is um, the way they talk to themselves, like with road rage or with anything else, that if they talk to themselves aggressively, they tend to feel more aggressive and get more aggressive. So they have to watch the kind of ways that they talk to themselves or talk to other people. Okay. 
going to talk to you about a deep domestic conversation between Ms. Arias and Mr. Alexander on May 10th of so the next day. Did you review, this is instant messaging, not text. You're looking at text. Oh, this is the text. <laughs> okay. So we're talking about an instant message conversation that goes back and forth between the two of them. Yes. Uh, from May 10th. Are you aware of a conversation where they talk about somebody named Wayne Dyer? Yes. Do you know who Wayne Dyer is? Yes. Wayne Dyer is um, uh, a motivational speaker, and he's considered kind of a spiritual guru as well. He's on PBS a lot. And he's written a, a number of books. Okay. And are they having a conversation about uh, about this person, this motivational speaker? Yes, they are. Are they talking in this conversation about how how Mr. Dyer is making a joke out of the fact that he has a temper? They're talking about uh, Mr. Dyer's daughters teasing him about his temper. And then from talking about Mr. Dyer's temper, about getting teased by his daughters about his temper, uh, does the conversation turn to Mr. Alexander's temper? Yes, it does. And does he, does Mr. Alexander in his own words talk about his temper? Yes, he does. And does he compare his temper to Mr. Dyer's? He does. He says his temper... Sustained. May we approach? All right, does, does Mr. Alexander, he compares his temper to Mr. Dyer, right? Yes, he does. And does he say that his temper is far worse? Yes. Overruled. Yes, he does. And not quoting him, but generally speaking, uh, does he talk about how his temper um, if he were able to contain, if he were able to uh, harness his temper, he would be unstoppable. Objection. Meeting. Question incorporates hearsay. Approach, please. Ms. LaViola, in your review of this case, did you? You've reviewed a instant message conversation between Ms. Arias and Mr. Alexander on May 10th, right? Yes, I did. And I'm going to read it to you, and then I want you to tell me how it's important to you. All right. Okay? Where Ms. Arias says, they're, and again, they're talking about Wayne Dyer. Right. This, this uh, uh, motivational speaker. Yes. Ms. Arias says, he jokes about his daughters, tease him about losing his temper, and then she jokes... Oh, who's the enlightened spiritual guru? Tra Mr. Alexander answers, yeah, I know, but they see him at his worst, and I promise my worst is worse. Travis goes on, Mr. Alexander goes on, so far. I've seen, and then Miss Arias says, I've seen your worst. We haven't walked in his shoes, but I take that bet. Mr. Alexander says, ha, huh, yeah, if I could transmit that fury, I couldn't be stopped. To what? I didn't. I you read the wrong word. Yeah, if I could transmit that fury, transmute. I couldn't be stopped. Transmute. I said transmute. That's what it says. I think we're talking about transmit versus transmute. Correct. I'm just reading what it says exactly. All right. Okay. And Mr. Alexander says that shiz is scary. Yes. And Ms. Arias says, you'll master it one day. Did you review this? Yes, I did. And is it important to you about Mr. Alexander talking about his temper? Yes, it's very important to me. Um, a lot of the folks that I work with are afraid of their own anger. They're afraid of how far it's gone. They're afraid of what they'll do with it. And they hope they can control it. Um, it's big energy. It's huge energy. It can make somebody feel very powerful to be that angry, but it is scary for them. And unless they get help, it continues to be scary for them. And is that what you see in reading this conversation between Mr. Alexander and Ms. Arias? 
I see that, and I see that um, there is an exchange where they're both acknowledging his anger. She's acknowledging that she's seen it, and he's acknowledging that he has it. And I should, for the record, Judge, uh, this I'm reading from exhibit number 595. In another part of this conversation, did you review part of the conversation where Ms. Arias is talking about her self-esteem? Yes, but I'd need to review that. All right, Judge, may I approach? Yes. I'm handing you exhibit, what's been marked as exhibit 595. Oh, okay. So is there another part of that conversation with when Ms. Arias is talking about her own self-esteem? Yes, she is. And is, is Mr. Alexander trying to make her feel better? Well, on and off, I mean, he, he tells her... Sustained. Can you summarize the conversation for us without uh, why you believe that Miss Arias is talking about her self-esteem? Well, she's talking about her self-esteem. She's talking about how she feels on the inside and how badly she feels on the inside and that she was the innocent porn star who now feels lousy about herself. And so does that give you insight, as, as of May 10th of 2008, does that give you insight to how Miss Arias was feeling about herself from this relationship? Yes. Because in this, are they talking about their relationship? They're talking about their relationship. Thank They're talking about their relationship? They're, yes? ta they're talking. Yes, they are. Okay. Are they are they talking about other things? They're talking about. Um, yes, sustained. What else are they talking about? In summary, of course. About their sexual relationship, Mr. Alexander is a well. Oh, she's already answered the question. Sustained. She has not answered the question. Is Mr. Alexander comparing Miss Arias with other women he's been with? Objection. Question assumes. Overruled. Yes, he is. He's comparing her to uh, two or three other women. He's, he's basically saying that she has no uh, sexual equivalent except for maybe these other two women who are okay. But he basically says there's no sexual equivalent to her and that these other two women have been enjoyable and that there's a third woman who uh, he thinks uh, might have been, but he didn't get far enough along to see. And in that sense, is that is that his attempt to try and make her feel better about herself in a sexual way? I'm sorry, what was the objection? Speculation is he attempting. Sustained. All right, but we know that he was comparing her with other women. Yes. Do you know, based on this conversation, were these women before Miss Arias or after Miss Arias? They were before Miss Arias. Okay. The fact that he's con comparing uh, women on a sexual basis, and he's talking about these women who were in his life prior to being with Miss Arias, does that speak to any type of deception from Mr. Alexander? Yes. In what way? Well, he continues to claim that he's a virgin um, to numbers of women that he, he has uh, relationship with either by uh, virtue of text or I am or in person. And he continues to say he's a virgin and apparently Prior to Miss Arias, he had sexual relationships with other women. In your review of this case, did you also listen to a tape recorded, uh, and basically what you would say is phone sex? Yes. And was that between Mr. Ari or Mr. Alexander and Miss Arias? Yes, it was. As far as domestic violence is concerned, does this, does, does this, the fact that they were talking 
Um, and in May, and this tape was made in May of 2008, is that right? Yes. And the fact that they were talking in May of 2008 of this nature, does that mean anything to you? I'm, I'm not sure. Does it mean anything in, in relationship to domestic violence? Well, yes, in the sense, does it tell you anything about whether or not Miss Arias was completely separated from him? Well, it indicates that she wasn't okay. completely separated from him. All right, and is that, the, is that the indications that you're getting all along here, that she's making steps but not fully separated? Absolutely. Did you review a journal writing from Miss Arias from May 22nd? Yes, but I need to see exactly what you're referring to. All right. Judge May approach. Yes. This is the Exhibit 591. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, now, May 22nd of 2008, is Miss Arias writing about a conversation she has with Mr. Alexander? Yes. And generally speaking, not quoting, what is the subject matter of their conversation that she's writing about? It's the conversation uh, that that basically talking about the separation and that um, uh, it will be good for both of them. She talks about the laws of chastity, and um, he gets upset. He gets offended and tells her he already knows about the laws of chastity. Um, when she talks about the laws of chastity, is she trying to give him reasons why they shouldn't be physical, uh, good reasons why they shouldn't be physical anymore? Sustained. Does she say? Does she say specifically in her journal writing why she talks to him about the laws of chastity? She talks to him about the laws of. Yes. Okay. Then what does she say? Generally speaking. Section here, sir. Approach, please. You may continue. All right. We were specifically looking at if she writes about a reason why she talks to Mr. Alexander about the laws of chastity. Yes. Okay. And does she give a reason? Yes, she okay. does. And what, what is that? Um, that it would help them not to be physical. She doesn't. She thinks that they their physical relationship needs to end, basically. Okay. Is she trying to give him like sweet talk him into reasons why they shouldn't be physical anymore? Yes, she is. And from him, you said he, he got upset. Yes. Does she talk about how things got worse after he just gets upset? Yes, she did. And how did they get worse? He um, wanted to know who she was seeing or if she was seeing... Some... It's the same thing. Uh, overall. Wanted to know uh, who she was seeing and basically if she was getting her kicks with someone else and um, those kind of questions. And Miss Arias indicated that she didn't freak out when that she. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I said go ahead. Oh, that she didn't freak out when he was seeing Mimi, and that she had the right to see somebody else if she wanted to see somebody else, but um, that she wasn't getting her kicks or hadn't been with anybody else since Mr. Alexander. So when she talks about things getting worse, is it because based on her writings of the conversation? that Mr. Alexander was was acting jealously. Yes. And was he then accusatory w about her having another relationship? Yes. At this point in time, is Miss Arias able to actually say, it's okay if I were to have another relationship? Yes, she is. What does that mean to you? It means the cloth is torn a little more. It means that the, the relationship, she's able to assert herself more than she was before, but she's still not out of it. But she's more assertive, she's more able to tell him, and she's more interested, it seems like, in, in moving on from the relationship. And the more that this cloth is torn, the more that she's able to speak her mind or be assertive with Mr. Alexander about her ability to talk to other men, what does that do? And, and I guess we can speak generally with abusive men, the more that they're partner is able to assert themselves or pull themselves away, what does that do to an abusive man? Well, there's more powerlessness involved in it. Than what, what happens when there's more powerlessness? There's more, there's generally speaking more anger and more rage because there's more fear when the person, as long as you have that power differential, 
you're able to, to feel in control. When you start losing that uh, power, you start to feel loss of control. And when she talks about how she, does she talk about the fact that he talks to her about his undying love for Mimi? Yes. And what are her feelings about that? She's okay with it. She seems, in her journal, she writes that she's fine with that, and she didn't freak out about it. And when she talks to Mr. Alexander about it, how does he respond to such a thing? And if you need to review, that's fine. He apologizes to her. And does he tell her to leave his life, love life out of it? I'm looking at page 363. Basically, he says that um, he's frustrated because things aren't going well with Mimi. In this same writing, does she go on to talk ab about very positive things about Mr. Alexander? She says that... Stained. I know that you said she says, but are you going to summarize for us? Yes. Okay, go ahead. The the question. Does he say yes or no? Restate your question. Does does she talk about um, in this? Does she talk about him in a positive manner? Yes. And does she really? Does she go on a bit about how much she cares for him, or what she thinks of him? I need to review that. Sure. So does she speak positively about him? Yes, she does. Okay. And does she say that it's sad that they're agreeing to part ways amicably? Yes. But that it's something that's good for both of them? Yes. And in reading Mr. Alexander's journals, does he have that same opinion that it's good for both of them? Yes, he does. And Mr. Alexander's journals that we reviewed earlier, that was in uh, late March and early April where he's talking, or I'm sorry, it's uh, April, early April where he's talking about that it's good, it's probably good for them to part ways. Yes. But yet, even though they part ways, we saw through the text messages later on that he's still contacting her, right? Yes, he is. Foundation speculation as to who initiated contact. Sustained. We are going to take the noon recess at this time, ladies and gentlemen. Please be back in the designated area at 125. Remember the admonition. You are excused. Have a nice lunch. Record will show the jury has left the courtroom. You may step down. Counsel, anything else before lunch? Okay.